And you know how cheap space travel has become? You know the movie The Martian with Matt Damon? Come on, raise your hand. How many people have seen that movie The Martian with Matt Damon? You know how much that movie cost? A hundred million. Now, the Indians sent a probe to Mars for 70 million. You realize that a Hollywood movie about going to Mars costs more than actually going to Mars. That's how cheap space travel has, has become. And this rocket is going to be replaced by Elon Musk's masterpiece, an even bigger rocket that will take us to Mars. It's called the BFR. B for big, R for rocket, and F for your imagination. And just think about that. It turns out that the first innovation of the 1960s was to miniaturize transistors. We had to create space capsules in the 1960s with miniature transistors, and that helped to create the computer revolution of today. And now, as we go to Mars, we're talking about a second, a second computer revolution, this time with quantum computers this time with artificial intelligence, this time with learning machines. You know, I'm on radio, and a lot of people call me, and they say to me, Professor, where did the internet come from? The iPhone, all these wonders, it happened so suddenly. It must have been from aliens from outer space. We must have captured a flying saucer, and that's where all this technology came from. Nope. It came from the space program. And now we're entering the second era of space exploration. And by the way, these people say that they know that aliens gave us the iPhone, the internet, because they've been abducted. And they've been in these flying saucers. I tell them, the next time you're in a flying saucer, for God's sake, steal something. I don't care what it is, an alien chip, an alien paperweight, anything. So you have bragging rights afterwards. And remember, there's no law against stealing from an extraterrestrial. <laughs> so steal away and have proof that you were in outer space. So once again, the President of the United States has stated that yes, we're going to the moon starting next year. Next year, we send an unmanned probe to the moon. After that, we have an orbiting station around the moon, and then on to Mars. New technologies are required to go to Mars. As I said, artificial intelligence, neural networks, quantum computers will be necessary to propel us to the red planet, a new second computer revolution is in store for us. So just remember that we are witnessing a new era. And of course, we have to remember the past. You see, this is a scene from 65 million years ago. Why do we need a space program anyway? Well, the dinosaurs did not have a space program. And that's why they're not here today to argue this question. Okay. This dinosaur on the left, witnessing these meteors come down from out of space, what is he thinking? He's probably thinking, uh-oh. And the dinosaur on the right, what was he thinking? He was probably thinking, oh, shucks. The dinosaurs did not have a space program, but we do. That's why we need an insurance policy. And that's why I think that we should, as Elon Musk says, become a multi-planet species. And the backbone of that effort will be artificial intelligence, neural networks, and quantum computers. Now today, IBM is one of the leaders in cloud technology. You know, when I was in high school and the System 360 first arrived, that was my first impression of the future. To me, IBM has always meant the future. Because IBM 
when, where no one had gone before. And now we're talking about IBM in cloud computing. And today, the next step beyond that is artificial intelligence. You will not only have virtual reality, you'll talk to it, and it will talk back to you. Already, doctors in the operating room have glasses that can access the internet. That's today. In the future, it will be artificially intelligent. You'll talk to it using a computer program like Watson. You'll talk to it, and it'll talk back to you. Any professional will use this technology. If you're an astronaut and you're making repairs on the space station, you'll be able to talk to it and make repairs on the spot. If you are a doctor doing surgery, you'll be able to have somebody help you right there on the operating table. So no matter what occupation you are in, artificial intelligence will be right there. And then, of course, beyond that, we're going to put the internet in your contact lens. And who were the first people to buy internet contact lenses? College students taking final examinations. <laughs> yes, they will blink, and they'll see all the answers to my exam right there in your contact lens. Very handy. Tonight, for example, let's say you're at a cocktail party. And you're talking to some very important people at the cocktail party, but you don't know who they are. In the future, you will know exactly who to suck up to at any cocktail party, because <laughs> you'll see their biography right there in your contact lens. So just remember, we're going to have instantaneous knowledge. Not only that, you'll be able to talk to it, and it'll talk back to you with specialized information. If you were a contractor building an apartment house, an engineer designing a building, a designer designing a new car, you'll be able to access specialized information. And that's exactly what the IBM Watson computer is all about. And when you want to have specialized information in your home, you'll go to your wallpaper and talk to it because paper is going to be digitized. Already, your cell phone can have flexible paper of any size, which means that from your cell phone, you can extract out a screen as big as you want, type on it, fold it up, and put it back into your cell phone. So you will talk to the wall. You will say, mirror, mirror on the wall, and you will access as much information as you need. And who are you going to talk to? Let's say it's 4 o'clock in the morning, and you have a pain in your chest. You, is it a heart attack? Do you wake up the whole house? Or is it the pizza you had last night? You go to the wallpaper, and you say, mirror, mirror on the wall, I want to talk to RoboDoc. Boom. RoboDoc appears in your intelligent wallpaper, giving you sound medical advice accessing the entire internet just by talking to it. And let's say that you're in a, driving in a city like Europe, but you're in a car accident. You're in a car accident, and you have to talk to someone with legal information. What do you do? You talk to your wristwatch, and you talk to RoboLawyer. RoboLawyer is right there in your wristwatch because you'll have expert information anywhere you go. So that's the promise, the promise of artificial intelligence, giving you specialized information anytime, anywhere. And then, of course, we have the fact that artificial intelligence could drive the economy as well. You know, we have something called the battle of the billionaires. On one hand, we have Mark Zuckerberg, who says that artificial intelligence will create new jobs, new opportunities, new billionaires waiting to be minted. And then we have Elon Musk of SpaceX saying, not so fast. They pose an existential threat. So who's right, Zuckerberg or Musk? Well, my personal point of view is very simple. In the short term, Zuckerberg is right. 
We're talking about entire industries waiting to be born, new opportunities, jobs, productive capabilities to energize the economy. But let's not be naive. On the long term, robots do potentially pose an existential risk. What is the tipping point? The tipping point between Zuckerberg and Musk is the question of self-awareness. You see, robots do not know they are robots. Robots are adding machines. We forget that. They're not thinking in the usual sense of the word. They're not self-aware. In fact, our most advanced robots today have the intelligence of a cockroach, a stupid cockroach, a lobotomized stupid cockroach. However, as time goes by, they're going to be as smart as a mouse, then as smart as a rat, then as smart as a rabbit, then as smart as a cat, then a dog, and then a monkey. At that point, by the end of the century, they could be dangerous. Because these monkeys are self-aware. Monkeys know they are not human. Now, dogs are confused. <laughs> you see, dogs think that we are a dog. Dogs think that we are the top dog, and they're the underdog. So their con conception of self-awareness is a little bit fuzzy. But by the time robots become as smart as a monkey, then there's no question they know they are monkeys. At that point, I think we shall put a chip in their brain to shut them off if they have murderous thoughts. So this is going to be, I think, in the end of the century. We have plenty of time to prepare for it. As the former director of MIT's Artificial Intelligence Laboratory once told me, the probability that a robot will walk out of somebody's garage with human intelligence is similar to the probability that a hurricane will create a Boeing 740 jet out of debris. In other words, it ain't going to happen anytime soon. However, I personally believe that the robotics industry will become bigger than the automobile industry of today. How do we know that? Because in the future, your automobile will become a robot. You'll talk to it. You'll argue with it. You'll have all sorts of conversations with your car. So the car will become part of the robotics industry. Not only that, but I think robotics are going to change the way we view medicine. You see, we have had four waves of innovation that have energized our society. The first wave was steam power. When we physicists worked out the laws of thermodynamics, that gave us the steam engine, which gave us the industrial revolution and machines. So that's when we physicists worked out thermodynamics, the laws of heat. Second, 80 years after that, we physicists worked out the laws of electricity and magnetism. And that gave us television, radio. It gave us the electric revolution of today. 80 years after that, we physicists invented the transistor. We invented the laser. We invented the space program. And that gave us high technology. So the first wave was steam power. The second wave was electricity. The third wave was high tech. The question is, what is the fourth wave? The fourth wave, I claim, is going to be artificial intelligence, biotech, and nanotech. So let us now talk about the digitization of the human body. Already in surgery, surgery can be done on the internet and we're going to have artificial intelligence in the operating room so that doctors will be able to talk to Watson even as they perform surgery. And robots are going to be in the home. Also in Japan, 
They are creating robot nurses. In fact, the Japanese are the leaders in creating robot nurses. And why is that? Because the Japanese population is contracting right now. And because they're contracting, and because the population is aging, they need robots to take care of an aging population. So something similar will happen here as well. Also, we're going to put these robots inside our body. We're going to take a small aspirin pill. We can do this today. Put a chip in it with a magnet and a camera. You swallow it, and we can track the motion of this capsule as it goes into your stomach and into your intestines, sending gorgeous pictures of your insides. Because we all know what middle-aged men fear the most. They fear the C word, colonoscopy. That's when they stick that tube up your rear. But this gives new meaning for the expression, Intel inside. <laughs> yes, Intel will always be inside. So we are going to digitize the human body. This is going to be the next big breakthrough in computer technology. And we're going to solve problems like the aging process. Let's say we take the genome of millions of old people. Then we take the genome of millions of young people. And then we have artificial intelligence to analyze the difference between the genes of old people and the genes of young people. Bingo! That's how we find the genes where aging takes place. We have already found 60 genes involved in the aging process. So here's a simple experiment. In a car, where does aging take place in a car? Well, that's obvious, right? The engine, and why the engine? Because that's where you have moving parts and you have oxidation and combustion. Well, where in the human body do you have the engine? And the answer is the mitochondria. Bingo. We have now found where aging takes place in the human body. The genes of the mitochondria are the first to be damaged by the aging process. Now, certain animals don't age hardly at all. For example, the Greenland shark. The Greenland shark lives to be over 400 years of age. How do we know that? You take the eyeball of the Greenland shark, and you realize that it adds a layer every year, like a tree ring. By counting the rings on the eye of the Greenland shark, you know that it lives to be more than 400 years of age. So the point here is, one day, when we digitize the human body, then we'll also have the option of perhaps solving the aging process itself. Some scientists speculate that our grandkids, our grandkids, when they reach the age of 30, they may simply stop aging. And they may live for many decades at the age of 30 because they like being 30 years of age. So artificial intelligence may be the key to the fountain of youth. And as our organs begin to get old and worn out, we will grow new organs. This is an ear. It is made out of plastic. We seed it from cells from your own ear. They grow into the plastic. The plastic eventually dissolves, leaving a perfect ear. We can now grow ears skin, bone, cartilage, heart valves. We can now grow windpipes. We can now grow body parts. The next major organ to be grown is the liver. So for all you alcoholics in the audience, <laughs> take heart. Yes, we will eventually solve the ability to create organs of the body like the liver. And when we replace them, we'll be able to rejuvenate parts of the body. And once again, because of artificial intelligence, because of computer technology, 
we may be able to solve the problem of the aging process. In fact, there are two kinds of aging. One is digital immortality as a possibility, and the other one is genetic immortality. We talked about genetic immortality. Artificial intelligence may analyze the data from millions of people and isolate the genes which control the aging process. But we can also digitize people as well. If you digitize somebody, you digitize everything known about that person, and you put it on a disk. In the future, when you go to the library, instead of taking out a book on Winston Churchill, you will talk to Winston Churchill. Because everything known about him has been digitized. His videos, his speeches, everything digitized. And you'll talk to him. You'll talk to a holographic image. I wouldn't mind talking to Einstein. I would love an opportunity to have a conversation with Einstein. One day, you may be digitized so that your great, 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 great grandkids may go to the library and have a conversation with you. Just think about that. Now, digital immortality, is that really you? Well, to paraphrase Bill Clinton, it all depends on how you define you. <laughs> if you are a biological entity, then no, you're talking to a tape recorder that can mimic everything known about you. But if you represents the sum total of your memories, your sensations, your history, your video, your Instagrams, your credit card transactions, if that is you, then in some sense, you can live forever in digitized form. In fact, I personally believe that one day, by the end of the century, when we can digitize people, we will put that information on a laser beam and send it into outer space. One second, you're on the moon. All your information, your soul, everything known about you, one second, you're on the moon. 15 minutes, you're on Mars. Four years, you're in Alpha Centauri. Think about that. Conquering the galaxy at the speed of light on a laser beam by shooting consciousness into outer space, perhaps by the end of this century. In fact, let me stick my neck out. I think that this already exists. I think that if there are aliens in outer space, they already have created a laser port, a laser superhighway, with millions, billions of souls laser porting themselves across the galaxy. And we, we humans, are too primitive to even know it. So the galaxy could be teeming with souls laser porting their consciousness across the galaxy, and we are too primitive to even know it. Now, the next big frontier, we mentioned artificial intelligence, we mentioned neural networks. Next is brain-computer interface. Many people ask the simple question, what is the next phase of the internet? Believe it or not, we think that the next phase of the internet is brain net. We will send emotions, feelings, memories on the internet. Two years ago, the first memories were recorded and uploaded in a mouse. Now we are doing it on monkeys, uploading and recording memories, and eventually we're going to do it on Alzheimer's patients. Alzheimer's patients will have a computer chip, they'll push a button, and memories, memories will come flooding into their hippocampus. They will know who they are, where they live, they'll, their memories will be gradually restored. In fact, some of you have seen the movie The Matrix, right? In the movie The Matrix, even reality itself was uploaded into your mind. Now, <laughs> let me ask you a weird question. Let me ask you a weird question. How many of you, late at night, just before you go to sleep, 
How many of you have ever had that weird feeling that maybe life is an illusion? That maybe life is an illusion. You're the only real person. But no, everything around you is fake. Come on, be honest. Raise your hand. Raise your hand if you ever had that feeling that maybe life is an illusion. Raise your hand. Oh my God, you're crazy. <laughs> you think you're the only real person in the universe? How can that be? I'm the only real person in the, in the universe. You know, I'm actually in New York right now, just dreaming that I'm here before this great audience, talking about the IBM cloud, talking about how IBM is the, the future. I mean, come on, I'm still back in New York City. Give me a break. <laughs> So the point I'm raising is very simple. We could be entering a new era, a new era of brain net. Already we can create exoskeletons shown here. Exoskeletons so that people can walk once again because a chip, a chip has been placed in their brain that allows them to communicate telepathically. Now, just a few days ago, my colleague Stephen Hawking passed away a great scientist, and people wonder, how did he communicate? Well, he used to communicate with his fingers. Then when he lost control of his fingers, he would communicate by blinking. And after he couldn't even do that, we put a chip in his right glass, which picked up radio waves from his brain, sent it to a laptop, which then typed out his thoughts. Stephen communicated telepathically in the last years of his life. By thinking, brain waves could be picked up by a chip, magnified, and then put into a laptop computer. Amazing. In fact, in Japan, commercially, you can buy a headband that measures brain activity. In this headband, which you can Google, there are two ears. When you talk to somebody at a party who's very interesting, the two ears light up like this. And when you talk to someone who's boring, the two ears go down like this. So in Japan, you always know if you're going to go home alone after a party. That's commercially available today. And we physicists, can now analyze blood flow inside the human brain. This is amazing. We can now actually see thoughts and therefore test theories of psychology that are very old but untestable. Now we can test them. For example, for you parents in the audience, every parent believes in their heart of hearts that teenagers suffer from brain damage. Absolutely true. You can show that blood flow in the prefrontal cortex, the thinking part of the brain, is actually not fully developed in teenagers. And that's why they can underestimate risk. Also, it's an old wives' tale. It's an old wives' tale that we can now test at a university. The old wives' tale is when a man talks to a pretty girl, he starts to act stupid. Absolutely true. Brain scans show that when a man talks to a pretty girl in an experiment, blood drains from the prefrontal cortex, <laughs> and he starts to act stupid, mentally retarded. Absolutely true. So we can now begin to decipher the workings of the human brain, which of course is amazing. Third, the third technology is quantum computers. You know that silicon will eventually be exhausted as a source of computer power? Why is that? Leakage. Leakage and also heat generation. The quantum principle essentially destroys the computing power of silicon if transistors become too small. We put millions of transistors on a chip, but there's a limit. At a certain point, transistors become the size of molecules and the size of atoms. And so there's a race now, a race 
between all the leading manufacturers, a race to perfect the first quantum computer, a computer that can outdo any ordinary silicon computer. And so I said, Silicon Valley could become a rust belt if you ignore the laws of physics. And I'm proud to say that IBM, once again, is one of the leaders one of the leaders in developing this technology of quantum computers. A technology so powerful that it can break any code, any code by any government within a matter of minutes. We now know that the CIA, because of all these leaks in government files, we now know that the CIA has actively looked at quantum computers because they have the capability of breaking any code anywhere on the Earth. And again, as we go to Mars, just like when we went to the moon in the 1960s, we're going to have to develop a new generation of computers in order to make sure that our probes function correctly, safely, and accurately as they go back to the moon and on to Mars. A second computer revolution is in the making because of the rejuvenized interest in the space program.